Shalom everyone, you are here again with Tzohar Lamikra. I again hope everyone is enjoying these recordings. Again, I'm actually getting good feedback on them, so I'm, I'm guessing I'm doing a, a good job here. And uh, I do know that I promised a recording about Shabbat, actually several recordings about Shabbat. Um, I will get to it. I might make a comment today about Shabbat, but uh, we'll see if uh, I can squeeze everything into the 20-30 minutes that I have with these recordings. Uh, but I am planning on actually doing a, a whole series by itself just on Shabbat, trying to tackle some of the issues. Um, obviously, I don't have absolute answers, never expect an absolute answer uh, when the subject is very vague in the Tanakh itself. Um, as you recall, I actually made some comments about Shabbat just to see how people react to things, and I think that uh, I've accumulated a lot of uh, good information about the subject, but still it requires a lot of research and um, laying down the different parts about Shabbat and how things were influenced in the past and how they influence us today and so on. So it's not going to be a simple subject to really do a whole series about Shabbat, but I'm going to get to it. The thing is I have at least one more exam. When I'm done with that exam, I'll be able to focus on the uh, on this uh, Shabbat project uh, more deeply. Um, so first of all, one of my favorite things always to point out when we're dealing with a, a portion is some of the scribal practices that we have. And there are actually two scribal practices I want to point out here. And they're not something, you know, actually one of them is very unique. Another one is something quite common. I'll actually start with the unique one, which is in uh, the first couple of uh, verses in the in Parashat Pinchas. And the first one, named Pinchas itself, is a very unique name. And some people link um, these names to actually to Egyptian names. Uh, for example, Hofni and Pinchas, also as mentioned with the sons of Eli or Eli, um, are Egyptian names as well. Some people think it's kind of some to the concept of tadpole or maybe the idea of a, a continuation of seed. But what's very interesting here is that the Egyptian names continued in the house of the priests. And we see that generations later, that house of Eli, uh, the name Pinchas shows up again and that actually relates to the whole thing of uh, maintaining f certain names in families. <clears throat> which connects to the whole um, idea of genealogies, which is actually part of our weekly portion here. And that's going to be one of the focus uh, subjects here today. But what's interesting is the, the, the broken Vav at the end of verse 12, where it says, the Beriti Shalom. And the, the breaking of the Vav is, I think this is the only place in the entire Tanakh that anything like this happens. And when scribes did practices like this, it could be one of two situations. Either... Someone made a mistake at some point and people sanctified this. And this is a very common thing, especially in traditional societies, where something reoccurs over and over again because someone made a mistake at some place in time. And I can point out many of these types of things. Um, it becomes sanctified and then people try to give excuses why it happens. Uh, the other thing is possible that someone deliberately did this and they were trying to hint to something. And this, is, this has to do with the... Uh, practices of the sufrim of the scribes where they were trying to hint to some concept or idea and the the idea that's usually presented about the vav is that there's something incomplete about the uh, about this covenant and the, the the problem with this is that you don't really see anything anywhere in the tanakh to indicate that there's something incomplete unless uh, you start going to some esoteric ideas like for example he received this covenant through an act of violence or that it might be hinting to a future situation where um, where um, if we say that the house of Eli were the continuation of Pinchas, for example, through the fact that the name Pinchas carries on uh, all the way to the house of Eli, then uh, it's quite possible. But one thing is very, very clear, that the original inscription uh, didn't have a broken vav. Um, to, to argue that, the, for, say, for example, that Moses wrote, wrote a broken vav to indicate something in the future is to, to create a predestination of, of things to happen, which is, again, something which is very, very unclear in Judaism, and there was actually a dispute in the Second Temple uh, between the Sadducees and the Pharisees regarding uh, predetermined futures for people, What's very interesting is, as far as I know, the Pharisees actually did believe in predetermination. Uh, and this is actually something that's, again, debated a lot. You know, is, does God force the future on people or do, does God just react? Is, is, is God in full control of everything, which raises questions about um, free will? 
or that God is more reactionist. He, he reacts to our deeds. I mean, he has the ability to see into the future, but he prefers not to do anything based on that knowledge and to see how mankind will react. And it's been a, a very interesting debate um, that you find about the relationship God has with mankind in regards to what man will do and how God reacts to that. Or is it really reaction or is it a pre-planned system? And I think that no one really has an answer for any of this because we're not God and we don't have the ability to go into the mind of God. And uh, as, as some, as you know, for example, as, as Book of Job says, you have no knowledge. God says to Job through the storm, you have no knowledge of how uh, animals do certain things and how animals um, control themselves. And you're going to start saying how I make decisions. So it's, it's very clear that this is going to be an ongoing debate until God decides to tell us what he knows and doesn't know. Um, but in any case, the this is one scribal practice. The other scribal practice is the enlarged nun in uh, chapter 27, verse 5. It says the word mishpatan. mishpatan. And an enlarged nun, the large letters are actually quite common um, in different places in the Torah. Uh, like, for example, in the Shema, where it says Shema Yisrael, the ayin is enlarged. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, and the Dal is enlarged as well to create the word Eid, which means a test, um, a, a witness. So when one recites the Shema, it's a testimony. And it's very, there's an interesting book that I read uh, by um, um, Moshe Wein, uh, Weinberg, I think his name was. And he actually goes into this whole discussion about the liturgy of using the Shema and the Ten Commandments. Um, no, sorry, it was Weinfeld, not Weinberg, Weinfeld, uh, Moshe Wein, uh, Weinfeld. And he, he actually demonstrates how the Shema was used and the Ten Commandments were used throughout the centuries as a, as a type of uh, community testimony to the, um, to the loyalty to God and so on. And what we find there is that really what people used to do as part of their public prayer was to recite the Shema out loud and also recite the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were actually uh, put away at one point, uh, as for example, it appears in the tractate of um, Brachot, the first tractate of the Talmud in the Jerusalem version, that uh, they removed the they removed the reading of the Ten Commandments because of a claim made by certain sectarian groups that only the Ten Commandments were actually spoken by God, which shows us also some of the arguments that existed back then about what was the Torah, what what were the real parts of the Torah. Um, but in any case, you, you have these enlarged letters, and sometimes they're there to mark the middle of the book, or the middle of the verses, or the middle of, you know, th there's different ways, different reasons for this. But also, I have a friend who kind of did some research on the subject of the enlarged letters. He, he, hold, he maintains the opinion that, it, that in places where there's no clear explanation, it's probably just a mistake. I mean, there are some places, like, for example, Olech al Gahon, where the Vav, uh, I think it's the Vav, in the book of Leviticus, where it speaks about... A clean and unclean animals where there's an animal that crawls on its belly so the the word gahon there is written with an enlarged letter and i think it's the vav there and that's actually the middle of the entire torah so that actually does make a lot of sense but there's a problem with this practice because how do you define what is the middle of something when you have different ways of spelling words so for example torah codes are very problematic because if we say for example we use the system spelling as we find in the first temple period then we'll be missing a lot of consonants especially consonants like vav and yud which which are uh dispensable and even a hey can be dispensable sometimes so it, it raises a question about all these different practices where you count letters or you 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 make different markings or toward bible code and by the way the bible code has been disproven uh, the, there's some mathematicians actually sat down to look at this, especially, um, I think her name is Maya, Dr. Ba Maya Bar-Hilel from the uh, Hebrew, I think she's from the Hebrew University, where she actually demonstrates that the whole, the whole idea is very, very flawed. And really, the, the, the practice itself of the Bible Code, it really begins around the 1600s. So it's a relatively new thing, and it's been discussed. But then, you know, you have... Unfortunately, people with agendas trying to prove ideas, and actually what they're doing is making a mockery of the Torah when, when they insist that these things are real, but then other people come up and show that they're not. And this is a problem that's widespread in all religions, uh, people trying to prove the truth of their of what they believe in by, by trying to argue different uh, knowledge and things like that. I mean, I was... When I was working in, in um, the food industry, I used to work a lot with Muslims, and they kept on claiming something is written in the Qur'an, 
And at one point I turned around and said, I said to him, I, I dare you to find that verse in the Quran. I dare you to find any of that information in the Quran. And uh, obviously they never came back with it because obviously it was nonsense. But in any case, it's a very, very common thing. It's a very sad thing as well that people do. Uh, another very interesting thing is the a word which appears in these verses, and it says that um, he's given a kehunat olam. So the word kohen obviously means a priest, but kehunat olam is an eternal priesthood. So some people try to argue that this actually relates to the idea that um, either Pinchas has just received the high priesthood, which means that the genealogy of the high priest is going to go through him, or that he is given an eternal promise that he will be that his family will be priests, and then there's this whole idea that Pinchas was not a Kohen because he was too young. But there's no real evidence of this, and it seems to be a kunat olam is very similar to the idea with David that he his family will always be rulers over Israel. That there's always going to be someone involved in the priesthood or someone always involved in the kingship of Israel. And um, for actually, there are a lot of testimonies of people that continue the families of the pre, of the, the 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 kingship for a very very long time. I mean, when they returned to Zion in four at uh, five thirty eight, um, the people came with them. Zubavel ben Shaltiel, whereas Zubavel wasn't really the son of Shaltiel; it was the grandson of Shaltiel. And apparently, Zubavel's father was just a very problematic character. They, so they preferred to have his genealogy go through, skip one generation and skip from his grandfather to him instead of mentioning his father because apparently his father was uh, very secular or maybe even uh, went against Torah. And um, really, you, you for, for many, many centuries, even after the destruction of the first temple, many people continued the genealogy of the house of David that, to a point where the Rosh Agola, the Resh Galuta, the head of the diaspora in Babylon, uh, up to around the 10th or 11th century was still someone from the house of David. So that continued on and on and on. But the problem is that the, the, the leadership systems inside Judaism were taken apart uh, by that point, and then um, there were no actual leaders. But there are specific families that do trace their genealogy. I think there's like 10 or 11 families that... Um, that uh, trace their genealogy all the way back to King David, and these are well-known, famous families. And unfortunately, they don't receive the respect they should as descendants of David, but these are well-documented families, like, for example, the Dutch family known as Shaltiel, and their genealogy is well-documented. And um, there was actually, back in the 90s, a TV program made by uh, Channel One in Israel that traced back some of these families and found them and there's actually a list of very, very specific names. And what's interesting is a lot of these families actually came from Spain, and the Chaltiel family um, migrated into into uh, into Holland and or the Netherlands. Some 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 Dutch people I meet keep on getting upset when people say Holland, and they say it's called the Netherlands. And they uh, they they're still there. I mean, their families still exist. It's a very it's a very interesting subject. The the whole thing about the House of David. In any case, so we go into this into this parasha, and we have the whole genea all the genealogies here. And what's very important is the fact that genealogies are always mentioned named after the father, after the males of the family, and never after the mother. And but then we have the whole situation with the son, with sorry, the daughters of Tzlofhad, which complain that you know they can't inherit because they're women, and we need to understand the subject of you know. What exactly is a family and how families were structured back then? And what's very, very clear is that though uh, there could have been in history women who were very, very important to a point like, for example, Yoav um, ben um, Tziruya, or the, the, the sons of Tziruya. Tziruya was a woman's name. This is Joab and his brothers and Avishai. And, and then the Asael. So you have your Av, uh, Av, Avishai, or Avshai sometimes appears, and Asael. And they were the sons of Tseruya. Now, Tseruya is a woman's name. And it seems to be that she they were named after their mother because their mother, according to, the, according to some sources, was the sister of King David. So sometimes women did become important, but it wasn't because of them. It was because of which family they belonged to. So we see there's a very, very strong patriarchal um, genealogy system, and it was very, very common in the in in the, in the East in general. Where people usually need to know who your father was, 
and not who your mother was. Though, again, as we said, if, in certain situations, if the mother came from an important family, then the mother would be named as well. And this raises the whole discussion about um, Jewishness. Where, where does a Jewish line come from? And I've spoken about this quite a few times, and I'm going to bring it up again. Um, when you look through the Tanakh, everything goes through the father. And, and I'll get to the inheritance issue for in a second as well. And then suddenly, somewhere in the middle of the second temple, we start, everything suddenly goes through the mother. And there's a, there's a problem, there's a bit of a problem here that is created through some of the fossilization of practices in Judaism, something that I've been debating with friends for probably 20 years now. And one of the issues with Judaism is that we always have this feeling that the generation before us was better. And if they made a decision, we don't have the right to uh, to change that. But on the other hand, there is the opposite of that as well, that sometimes, oh, they just said something, but we're going to do something completely different. And that relates, for example, the subject of Goy Shel Shabbat, a, a non-Israelite that you, you get you get to work during Shabbat. And I actually just finished reading a whole uh, list of... Uh, uh, decisions that were made in the in the 1700s regarding this subject, where they actually objected to the idea of having a a goyish Shabbat, and I'll expand on this when I talk about uh, the Shabbat subject in a couple of weeks. But what's very interesting here is that because of a very specific situation they were in, which had to do with the um, with uh, the the wars between the Hasmoneans, actually what came before the Hasmonean wars, and um, and with the Greeks, then there was a decision made to, to allow genealogy to go through the mother. And this was, a, this was a decision that was supposed to fix something about one or two generations. Because unfortunately, in wars, you know, women get raped, unfortunately, and, uh, and uh, some of them get pregnant. And you have a child and you have to make a decision. What do you do with this child? Do you abandon the child because the father is not an Israelite? Or do you protect this child because, again, there's no one to... Are you going to kill someone just because of uh, the fact that their mother were raped? was raped? So the decision was made to allow the genealogy to go through the mother just to solve this issue until, you know, and let it die out, let the question die out um, and people not remember what happened, give it two, three generations and it's gone. And the problem is it's stuck either because it took longer for this argument to vanish, or just people said, well, they made a decision, therefore we're not going to reverse it, which obviously is a reversal of anything that was practiced before that, which, again, it's a big, big question how on earth you can do that. But um, Jewishness, or belong actually, we don't even use the word Jewishness, belonging to a specific uh, social group was always connected to your father. And was never connected to the mother. And the only group of people today, the only two groups of people today that uh, still maintain, or at least strongly maintain, the idea of genealogy through the father are Karaites and Samaritans. Obviously, I'm talking about Muslims do the same thing as well. People are usually named after the father, some someone ibn someone, uh, and so on. But uh, which is which really fits the culture of the of the Middle East and the ancient Near East. But um, in, Jew, in in Jewish practice, suddenly went through the mother, and this is why. There are a lot of questions today about, um, you know, what what you know can we reverse this practice? Should we reverse this practice? Because for example, if you reverse this practice, you'll have bunches of people that the, for example, the mother's Jewish, the father isn't, and suddenly you're going to turn around to them and say, well, but technically you're not really Jewish. Um, I think Karaites actually made a decision as to, one of the parents has to be Jewish, and then it's perfectly fine. And there's an interesting element of this because in the story of the building of the temple in the book of kings there is a man from the tribe of dan that his mother was from the tribe of dan but it seems to be his father was a, a non-israelite man and he was still accepted so again the question of what exactly is jewishness and so on is, is a, an ongoing question but from genealogies it's obviously from the father but i think that story about the man from um, the man from the tribe of dan shows us that there was a certain leniency towards situations like this. And also, obviously, I think it, it seems to be that this man grew up in his mother's household, which meant he grew up as an Israelite. So being an Israelite is also an identity of what do you associate yourself with and what you actually practice. If you, if you are born in a situation like this and you're practicing the worship of some pagan god, then you can't really, decide, can't really declare yourself as an Israelite. But if you're born and you're, you're practicing Torah, then okay, you're an Israelite. I mean, being an Israelite 
seems to be mostly about blood ties, but obviously you know, a person who associates himself with Israel and associates himself with keeping Torah, then that person automatically turns into an Israelite as well. You can go listen to the discussion I did about conversion some time ago. You can find it on my YouTube channel. Uh, in any case, so you have the daughters of Tzlafhad, and what's very interesting here is that it seems to be that the verses are describing that the inheritance goes through the daughter, which is very, very clear, but obviously it creates a bit of a conundrum, because if they get married with someone else who's not from the family, or not from the tribe, I think mostly not from the family, uh, the, 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 the land would be given away to the other family. So I was looking, looking at this a little bit more, and I was looking at some commentary at the subject, and one of the claims that was made about this is that though the though the genealogy though the, the the inheritance goes through the the females it seems to be that the ones who really do inherit the piece of land are actually the grandchildren now this doesn't appear in the text itself but from looking at uh, practices in other places in the in the ancient near east and you, again you have to be very very careful with comparative studies because the mentality of the Israelites and the mentality of the nations around around them was not necessarily the same. We can find similar lines or similar issues because this is a human society and this is a human society. And human societies, no matter what country you go to, there are very specific subjects that will keep on repeating themselves over and over and over again. So the fact that you find something similar in the ancient Near East does not prove anything. What it proves, that the Israelites and the Akkadians, for example, were human. That's what all it proves. But then there's a massive difference in mentality. But what's very interesting, ignoring the, the, what happened in the end with the daughters of Tzlafchad, who married their, um, their relatives, and yes, the Torah does allow marrying cousins, and I know that in Western thought, marrying one's cousin is, is a horrible act and so on, but that has to do with, with the Christian mentality of what it means to be a relative. But the Torah specifically d defines who are the relatives you're not supposed to lay with, and then everyone else is allowed, which also includes cousins. But in any case, what, it's, what we find in the ancient Near East is that the inheritance really went through the grandchildren, the male grandchildren. The mother is seen more as a... a a, um, like a, a, a live line that connects the grandfather to the to the grandchildren. The husband seems to be again again one of uh, just a vessel that enables this line between the, this line between the grandfather and the grandchildren. And it's not that the father inherits; it's really the grandchildren enabling the grandfather's inheritance to continue through his line through the grandchildren. And it seems to be that the the the, the inheritance was kept on. Uh, kept under the name of the original family. And the reason I claim this is that we find um, these there are these ostracas. An ostrica is a piece of clay with writing on it. Back then, back in the day, paper was a very, very expensive item. You had to either buy papyrus or leather. And papy papyrus is, is imported from Egypt, even though there are papyrus plants in this region as well, especially in the Valley of Ahula. Um, if you've never been there, it's a place that I've I've never really seen tourists go to, but it's a beautiful valley, and it's a beautiful place to go and see. And you know, when tourists come to Israel, they're usually taken to the Galilee to see the the, the Sea of Galilee, and they're taken to Jerusalem, the Judean Desert, and maybe the and maybe the Be'er Sheva, the Negev, and Tel Aviv. But people miss out on amazing areas where Israelites also lived. You know, people completely forget that there are, there were a lot of other sites. The fact that Tanakh is focused on the Judean area. It doesn't doesn't say that there weren't other things happening. You know, people, so people go to Megiddo and so on, but there are plenty of sites, plenty of places to just go and see, to just see the landscape that Israelites lived in. And it's 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 a, there's a large variety of landscapes, and the Valley of Ahula is one of them. And you can actually see Mount Hermon from there, and can understand sometimes some of the mentality of the Phoenicians or the Canaanites when they spoke about Tzaphon. And I have this claim that Tzaphon is really Tzaphon is the name of a mountain where the god El dwelt, and I think that Tzaphon is actually Mount Hermon, and it fits it fits some of the ideas. This is this is one of my claims, but in any case, what's interesting is that in these ostracas, which are a piece of clay from broken pottery, we find letters, and these are administrative letters that indicate pay, payment of taxes. And what's interesting is that there were regions or cities with regions around them named after 
some of the daughters of um, some of the daughters of Slavchad, which indicates that when they in, in, enter the land, the 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 properties themselves and probably the cities associated with them again when you say city when we're talking about massive cities can be small what we would call a village today but for them back then was a city um the the inheritance was kept under the name of the original owner probably to prevent any questions about who owns what now scholars obviously going to this whole discussion that this is really retrospect looking um retrospect writing that trying to explain an inheritance issue in the 8th century and it's not really in the 15th century but again that's their idea of what it might mean but they don't really represent they don't really present any actual factual evidence of, of this claim, but they make the claim anyhow. So they're always trying to disprove the Tanakh, but in many, many situations, when you really sit down and look closely at the arguments, you notice that it's, it's based on, on a, a, a uh, pre-conceived uh, idea and not necessarily what the text is actually saying. But what's very interesting, what is possible here from these ostracas that indicate the names of these specific places is that they made sure, as another precaution, that they made sure that the the land itself would continue to be under the name of the original founding father, or in this case, founding mother, to make sure that there is no debate about who owns the land and where the land goes to and, and, and who are the descendants and so on. So this is a very, very interesting subject. And you should know that the debate around women inheriting is, a, is actually something found in a lot of different documents. And it's very interesting. Though, the, the need for, for documentation of, le of legal um, situations is really one of the things that sparked writing. I mean, Writing began mostly to account for buy, for buying and selling. So, as the song goes, "Money makes the world go round." It's literally like that. It caused it, it's a catalyst for a lot of things that happened. But the other thing is, and we we learn all about, about all about legal systems and language and so on. Just because people documented what happened in the courts, so um, this there's actually one more, there's actually another subject I want to talk about, but I don't think there's going to be any time today for this. Uh, but there's the issue of authority, how how authority is passed on. I would just touch on one thing, is the concept of smicha, to uh, place authority on someone. And in Judaism, there's this concept called smicha, which is to lay one's hands upon a student's head and say, you are now officially a rabbi. And rabbis back in the day were people who received authority in a chain of greater rabbis. So today, for example, if someone's called a rabbi, <clears throat> it doesn't. <clears throat> it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that the uh, the person is a great one, because the word rav is from the word the Akkadian word, the Babylonian word rabu or rab, which means a great someone, a minister, or someone who is in a in a uh, military or a government uh, position that makes them great and bigger and greater than everyone else. So the day when people are called rabbis, it's a very difficult thing to call them rabbis because it doesn't represent the original intent of it. And also that today, um, because the chain of smicha, the chain of passing down authority actually was broken at one point, then it raises a lot of questions about who has authority today and, and so on. But one thing is very, very clear that um, some kid who goes, you know, some kid 25 years old who's very, very intelligent who goes and, and, and passes the, 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 the exams to become a rabbi doesn't make him a rabbi. If a rabbi doesn't have a community, then he doesn't have experience in being a rabu, which is a type of leader. So I'm, I'm very, I, I, I raise these types of questions more for thinking, not for, to try to undermine anyone or say, don't listen to them. If there's a specific rabbi that does recordings or, or does lectures or something, but they have no community, it doesn't remove the fact that they're, they're, they're doing, doing a good job. It's just, it just raises questions about using the title rabbi and what kind of an authority a person has. And Judaism actually has a, a system to define who is an authority and who isn't. So, for example, if someone's known as rabbi so-and-so, if, if they don't have a certain pedigree and they don't have a certain um, training in halachic fields, then it raises a lot of questions about can you even listen to this person or should you, you know, if, if you turn around and say I'm not going to listen to you have you really done anything wrong uh, questions of authority if you remember I mentioned this quite a few times questions of authority have always been a very very problematic subject but you know there's uh, an, another word to contemplate about in any case I hope people enjoyed this recording um, again if you're interested in Hebrew lessons you can contact me at, he at hebrewinisrael.gmail.com 
Uh, I also have my Bible class every Sunday. Not expensive, worthwhile, people really enjoying these classes. And again, if you have any questions or any specific topics you want me to talk about, I will get to them. I'm writing them down. It's just let me finish my exams and I'll get to them. Shabbat Shalom.